Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. All right. All right. Welcome to Next Economy Now. My name is Erin Axelrod. I'm a partner worker owner at Lyft Economy. And I'm joined today by Katie Bowman. Katie is a biomechanist and best-selling author of nine books, including Move Your DNA, Grow Wild, and her latest, Rethink Your Position. She's named one of Maria Shriver's Architects of Change, and she's changing the way we move and think about our need for movement. You can find out a lot more at her website, nutritiousmovement.com. And I wanted to share a quote from one of Katie's earlier books that sums up why we are so excited to have Katie on as a guest for our Next Economy Living mini-series. Here it is. So she writes, what if we can make ourselves, our communities, and our planet healthier all at the same time by moving our bodies more? Katie, it is such an honor to be in conversation with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So... I guess just to kick it off, I'd really love to hear from you. Can you tell us a little bit about your story and how specifically you got into the work you're doing today, particularly how you came to what I perceive as a very holistic, integrated perspective about the role of movement and activity in our lives? How long do you want to <laughs> give this segment? Because I, I'm 47 now, but I started pursuing movement personally in my late teens, where I found it physically transformative. And then from there, I studied it at university, the science of human movement, which was not particularly a holistic perspective. But like anything, when you first start, when you're when you're trying to learn a system, when you're trying to learn a big thing, you start with the nuts and bolts, and eventually you see how it goes together. So I think I've given you my, my first two pieces. It was like personal exposure to the healing benefits of movement, just beyond the physical, but to the emotional, psychological, then to studying more the nuts and bolts of it. And then using, after graduating my undergraduate in, in biomechanics, which is just the study of the way physical forces affect living systems, in this case, the way mechanical forces affect the expression of our physical experience, the way we are able to move and the way we feel physically and the things that we're able to do. And then I use that training to help other people troubleshoot their body, I would say just in like still in the nuts and bolts realm. And then I went to graduate school to study the same field, biomechanics, where I could help people who needed more tinkering within their body, like maybe they had more deeper seated issues greater disabilities that really needed someone who had the specialized knowledge of some of the nuts and bolts and movement. But at a certain point, when you've seen enough people who all have patterns to the issues, you know, they have the issues that arise in their body, but if you see enough bodies, you recognize patterns. And at that point, and probably in the time I was in graduate school, I started being interested in a cross-cultural perspective of disease and injury and movement and how all those things went together. Because in It stood out for me that people were struggling to do really everyday things with their body, things that we had been doing for eons, to all of a sudden become so problematic for such a large percentage of people. And that seemed, it just seemed strange to me. And I wasn't talking about athletes that use their body really hard. So much of the tinkering of biomechanics goes to special populations that are doing big physical things to help them be able to perform better. But I was looking around at sort of everyday people like myself and going, there's a problem in just performance of just everyday activities like walking, walking a half of a mile. And there's like an evolutionary biology that we're dealing with, you know, the fact that our bodies have been shaped by what we've done through eons and also that what we have done for a long time is often still necessary to maintain sort of our old operating systems and our old hardware and and softwares. So I started to look at the cultural choices that 
different groups made around movement. And that's when I really started to see like, oh, there's this, we have a cultural perspective on movement. And one of the choices that we're making, whether we recognized it or not, humans have been tinkering. Sort of maybe the defining characteristic of a human is like tinkering with things to change the outcome. Like that's not particularly new or novel, but as our technologies have become produced and dispensed wider than ever before, and we happen to be a culture that is tinkering for all the say convenience, but I'm using air quotes with convenience because I think in the end, we're not really saving time. We're saving movement. How did we create a landscape, so to speak, a societal landscape where the movement was the piece that retreated as we searched for other things? Like I could really just see like mechanically, oh, the movement is out of these living formulas, you know, of how we get things done, how humans and living systems get things done. There's a movement to those things, right? You could think of it as trade. You could think of it as something being picked up and dispensed in one particular area. But if you went to some of the earliest versions of those things, there was this physical actions transpiring between people, between groups of people. And movement has been the thing that we've been trying to get rid of to dispense things faster and farther. And so I just was able to start putting that phenomenon, sort of that real macro perspective, back with the nuts and bolts. It's like, oh, well, if you don't use your feet and knees and hips to like get to places, this is the expression of that. And when a person is struggling, it's like, why? Why is this happening? It's like, well, you could just look at the car as a recent invention. And while the car is not that recent, it's all relative, but while a car is maybe not that recent of an invention, the way we use it right now is radically different than the way my parents used a car and the way their parents used a car. So you're looking at two generations. Car is the technology, but there's like a ubiquitous distribution of cars and roads and everyone sort of a school's going to, you can no longer walk, you have to drive. And then everyone has to have this technology. And now the operating system is cars for society. And what does that mean for our spines, feet, knees, and hips that can't adapt or evolve at the pace that our technologies can keep changing and the way we keep changing society to match the technology. So that's where we are today. And now here I am on a podcast with you. <laughs> oh, there's so much in there, not to mention the way that our business is usual economy kind of justifies that removal of movement for the sake of saving time or having efficiency. One thing I really love about all of your books is the notion of replacing the self-interest, I would say, involved in countering that dominant narrative with saying, no, actually, it is giving me all these benefits to walk with my child to school, to take public transit and have more movement and activity instead of sitting sedentarily in a car to go out and harvest peppermint tea and have all the nuances of movement with my wrists and hands, as opposed to just plopping a tea bag in. To look behind me when I back up rather than using the backup window in my car. So my next question really is around this. What is movement? Why is it important? And how does it kind of relate to all these themes? You know, how does it differ from exercise? I know you've talked a lot about that in your work. So kind of let's level set for our listeners. What is movement? How is it different from exercise? And why is that important? Well, movement is just the physical change of your, your body in shape, in place or location. And so almost everything we do requires some sort of movement. I mean, really even sitting in a chair is a type of a movement. It's just one movement that you're doing over and over and over and over again. So there's the whole body as having a position and a shape, but really every position and shape is informing all of the smaller bodies that make up your bigger body. So you could think of your body as one, yes, but philosophically it's also multiple bodies. And those multiple bodies all sense the environment and then they deliver information about their experience to inform the whole as well. So there's def there's like an ecology just to yourself. You know, you have layers of information going on. When people hear movement, though, most people will think exercise because exercise is 
sort of this emerging concept that has come out of groups that are decreasing their movement in general for whatever particular reason, right? Because I don't think anyone would dispute the body's need for movement, right? Like I think that that's pretty clear. I mean, it's clear scientifically. I think it's clear experientially for most people. Like I will feel better when I'm moving. You know, like there, I've just never had any pushback. of like, does the body really need movement? It's like no one's ever really brought that to the table. But whether it needs exercise is arguable because exercise is taking sedentary space in the day and then saying, I know I need to move my body. And so I'm going to do it in like the definition of, well, the definition of movement's quite broad, you know, something about you just changing shape. The definition of exercise is a bit tighter. It's usually done for a predetermined amount of time. Like there's a duration to it. There's a predetermined intensity that you're going to do it. Like you figured out how hard you're going to work. You figured out the mode, the thing that you're going to do. It's usually repetitive in nature, meaning there's a set of movements that you're using over and over and over again. And you're doing it for the purpose of improving your well-being. So the intention, everything about it is predetermined. This is an economics podcast. So have you heard of like the sloth model that all humans will spend their time in a series of five domains, sleep, leisure, occupation, transportation, and health or sloth. This is a model of time that comes up with in public health and movement quite a bit because those are the domains of movement. Also, like they're the domains of life. So when I look at the sloth model, it's like, well, where does movement fit in? Exercise is a leisure time activity. It goes in the L category. Again, movement, if we just keep going generation, a few generations back, no one was exercising because all of those domains had more movement in them naturally. Well, we'll leave sleep aside because that's a little bit more complicated, but your leisure had more movement. You know, you're walking to where you're going to go. Your occupation probably had more movement. Transportation was much more human powered than it was right now. And your home, you know, in your yard, your landscape, all of these things were movement based. So as we transitioned away and not humans, but us, you know, probably the people listening to this podcast is that group moved away from having more physically active domains, the need for movement became clear. And since all those other spaces are filled, leisure now has to be the space that exercise goes in and you're doing it just for exercise stake. There's nothing else happening during that period of time, which is one of the reasons people struggle to be able to fit it in. Because we don't have, well, one, a lot of people don't have leisure activity. <laughs> Two, your leisure activity has probably a long to-do list of all of the other things that you would like to do to care for yourself. I always say like the nutrient density of our time has gone down quite a bit. There's not a lot of levels of things happening. And I, I always think of this beautiful passage in a book from a culture that really depended on processing a certain seed from this tree that would go on to provide oils and things that everyone else would need, as well as trading it. But the process was quite manual to be able to convert this thing into a resource to be consumed or distributed. But that work was also social time. That work, because it had been done for eons, was also the place where you could do this simple rhythmic activity that allowed you to sort of zone out where you could be engaging your body in this rhythmic activity, but you could still be connecting and hanging out and doing all these things. And so I call that stacking, right? This idea of sort of similar to permaculture where multiple things are happening in a single period of time. And as we've moved away from that, we have to pursue everything in series. We've gotten rid of most of our needs and we've kept most of our wants. So all of our needs now have to fit into our leisure time and exercise is struggling. It's fighting. You're, it's vying for its own time, but it's also when you're mentally fatigued, one of the most challenging things to make yourself be able to do. So it just keeps losing out. And because of that model, I really feel like that model explains why we have a harder time uptaking exercise 
But again, I don't think the solution is necessarily uptake more exercise. I think it's redistribute movement back into those other domains would be my perspective. And so that's fundamentally the difference. There's not that much difference physically in what you're doing, whether you're moving or exercising, but it's about the way you think about it. If you, when you think about movement, if you think it has to be done in a special outfit at a special place for a set period of time, that only those things count as movement, that would be the first uh, construct to let dissolve a little bit, be a little bit more flexible because it could be walking home after work. It could be walking to the grocery store. It could be the fact that you're carrying something more. You're carrying your luggage instead of rolling it behind you. Like all these other little things can start adding the load to your skeleton, which in the end is all we're trying to do with exercise. We're trying to get you to organize yourself in different ways against gravity more often through the day in sort of complex ways and taking your mass and moving it up and down farther than you normally go up and down, right? Usually you just stand up out of a chair and sit back down in a chair again. So you can you go all the way to the floor? Can you hang from something and pull the rest of your body up to it? Can you carry your weight up a height, even if it's up a mountain or up a hill or upstairs, you know, just taking your structure and moving it, agitating it in ways that you don't normally do. That's all movement is. Amazing. And I know that many of our listeners, especially perspectives from B Corp or folks that are engaged in office culture will already be kind of sympathetic to a lot of this because office culture is really having issues with sedentarism. And I know many of my clients, I've I've already referenced your work to them around this dynamic of how to bring your earbuds and have walking and talking meetings, how to, you know, bring more movement into the day that's oftentimes oriented towards computers. I'd love for you to widen the lens for all our listeners and talk about some of the economics significance, the the consequences of our sedentary society on both individuals, but also for our culture and society as a whole. Well, I had to look up economics because I'm not an economist. (laughs) And so I just want to make sure when you're asking about economics, the definition that I found most compelling is the production and consumption and transfer of wealth. Is that what you mean by economics? Is that the 101? I love it because that's what we talk about in our MBA course is how different people define economy. And for us, the way we define economy is sort of the set of strategies that collectively we've agreed upon to meet our basic needs. So when I hear you talk about movement, I think about how in our economy, we have made a select set of agreements or cultural norms that are maybe dominant culture around trading, for example, the physical health of individual people's bodies for the sake of maximization of profit. We see that in the healthcare industry. We see that in supply chains where we're exploiting people to do repetitive movements to harvest the crop or run the assembly line for the sake of, well, that's going to make the company more money. But what are all the sacrifices we're making for people's bodies, well-being, emotional, psychological? And we know this isn't new because this is industrialization and a lot of our big systemic economic challenges. But I'm sure you have kind of firsthand experience of, I mean, you write about it in the salt example in Grow Wild. I'd just be curious, you know, what you're paying attention to in terms of how movement is so consequential from like just the way people relate from a money perspective, from their life design perspective, all of that to me is a part of the economics of how we live. Right. So you use really economy or economics and culture interchangeably. They're almost the same concept for you is what I'm hearing. Well, it was really interesting. I'm just going to ramble here for a second because that's how I orient. One of the things I also saw when I was trying to put myself in the headspace of economics was the idea of like material prosperity, which I do think economics is also like everything has a bias. If you, you have a system that has a potential bias and I think economics, when I think of it anyway, I think of material prosperity, but we were talking about earlier, it made me think that perhaps we have not valued the material of ourselves, our cartilage, our bone density, 
the space in our spines, the muscle mass, like we are also not prosperous if we even just go straight down to the literal materials that we're made of. So we have like, it's almost like when we say material prosperity, we really just mean money. It's just financial prosperity. Because I think that many people have lots of money, but perhaps not as much material prosperity that they're physically experiencing. And maybe they can reconcile that with exercise. But then there is another group that doesn't have money, has also had to utilize their material prosperity And there's no time for exercise, right? That would be a physically laboring group. So we have both of those situations. And I I do tend to look at that in terms of groups. And of course, there's like a range in between. But you can see if you're in one or the other, right? If you are someone who has an income, who's generating income, has had to sacrifice yourself physically, maybe to sit down to make that income, but you have the leisure time and the money to address your particular issue. And then there is the other group or someone in a factory. Labor is fascinating to me. And so we are talking about the difference between movement and exercise. And if I were to draw you a diagram, it would be a big circle of movement. And I've done this, I think, in Move Your DNA. Big circle, that's movement. And then there's a smaller circle of exercise that sits inside of movement. Exercise is one type of movement. Exercise is movement, but not all movement is exercise. There's all the space around that circle. Labor as well is a physical process. I've become really fascinated with labor, which I think I would define, and I might change my definition later, but it's like the physical actions that get your needs met. Quite simply, water, food, shelter, community, mate, you know, however you want to think about that. Like there's physicality that's always been associated with those things. We are mostly enjoying, so many, I imagine listening to this, are enjoying all of those categories being met by outsourced labor. And outsourced labor could be people, but it could also be just technology. You know, the idea of, you know, you can swipe to get pretty much everything that I just listed. If you've been paying attention, you've just seen really the movement go down where the movement of just the swipe of a finger. As a biomechanist, I see things in terms of joints and then again, those nuts and bolts. It's like, wow, what used to take to go from the labor of building a house. And like, I'm not even talking about, I'm like going out to get the materials to buy the house all the way to people during the pandemic buying a house online, sight unseen through just a tech portal, the difference in the physical experience between those two things, that is such a good example of how we went from our grandparents or great-grandparents producing food in a much more labor-intensive way to preparing food to then just ordering food to go to ordering food online brought right to your house. I mean, like there's just been a shift, but the end product isn't really different. You're in your house, you have your food, but the physical landscape of you yourself and other people is what looks different. So because I see the world in that way, then the way movement, and I also think labor, like I was saying, Being able to understand the role of our individual labor in the system, that the labor is going to be done regardless. The question is, who's going to do your labor? And what flows down from that is important. And I think that I've pointed that out in a couple of essays and a couple of different books. But at the same time, also trying to get people to recognize their relationship with labor is mostly a negative one in their mind because they've never really had to do it. Now, I also want to say, like, I'm not here to glorify labor. I mean, labor and oppression are so hand in hand. I think there are many people who are like, I'm fine stepping away from labor because I come from a line of people, a situation, a place where labor was so oppressive, like I can't uptake it. And fair enough. I still want to point out the phenomenon of 
many people have an aversion to labor that don't come from that perspective. And I like to soften it to say, I think we might all naturally have an aversion to labor. And I don't mean like chores. I mean, more cellularly as this biological being where the paradox we have to deal with is humans have a tremendous need for physical movement. And at the same time, we have a software running that wants you to conserve energy and do it as little as possible. That's just the thing that we all have to deal with. So I try to reframe movement of like, no, really, you're going to want to do it because in the end, you're going to feel physically better. And if you can set up labor to be enjoyable, time with other people, getting yourself outside more, more connection with your family, learning about something outside of you know what you're reading on your particular screen, if you can tie or tether movement to these other things you also want that are these other needs, the chances of you picking it up more often, thus reducing burdens on other systems, I think in the end elevates everything. It elevates the systems that we're dependent on, the people that we're dependent on, the electricity that we're dependent, like however you want to think about it, it takes a lot to power our individual sedentarism. There's so much of what we're talking about right now, it's not framed in terms of movement, but that's essentially what's going on is how can I not do the work for what I need? I couldn't agree more. And it's part of why I find your work so compelling. And I couldn't agree more that in order for us to have the type of economics shifts we need to address wealth inequality, to address the built-in scarcity entrenched in our business as usual economy, we need to have a different relationship to, like you said, labor and movement. And I've even there's a bit of a, a kind of a fringe culture online that you can go down a wormhole, which I've, I've gone down around bike machinery and using bicycling to create smoothies, bike blending. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to this is, <laughs> this is a very exciting pathway we're going down. And you just recently published a book, Rethink Your Position. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to sort of how there's some tools in that book around this sort of cultural shift that we both agree is so fundamental. How can those tools be helpful for our listeners, whether that be for their personal health, their lives as a whole, maybe some of their economic woes or constraints? I'd just be curious to hear a little bit more from you around this book, why you wrote it, and what you're hoping it'll give to people as tools. Well, okay, so I just I just explained this like very heavy theoretical framework, right? You're like, okay, this sedentarism, like we've just been handed, it's been it's been coming for a long time and we're stepping right into it and sort of perpetuating it and teaching it and without even realizing it, probably promoting it. But I imagine a lot of people will hear this as like, I don't want to make other people do my work, but I can't. I'm not physically able to do my work. Right. And that's because for so many of us, our bodies are so informed. Our bodies are so are constantly informed by what we do. So if you haven't done a thing for a long time, let's say you've never run, the idea of like getting up and running a marathon every day, there's no way to do it. You're already failing in your mind before you even get started, right? You know, like physically, it's going to be impossible. You might make even a halfway attempt and end up injured, right? So like there's this whole distance between where we would be if we were just more physical throughout our lives. And I'm not talking about doing everything really hard, but just doing a little bit more regularly that we need to close that gap. And many people would say like, I'm just hurting because there's that physical hurt. But I also think there's sort of when you're in a place, there's a lot going on with pain. It's not all, you know, your bones rubbing together. Just sometimes like I don't feel – there's something in me that says like where I am right now isn't the place that I want to be. I want, like, I want to fix things or or whatever. I think that sometimes pain can come out of just that. I'll just leave that there. I wanted to create a tool for someone who is like, okay, let's just start with the labor it takes to maintain my house. I could be doing that more. What would I need to do? And I'll say, and what else would I need to undo? Because I think that part of the economy slash culture that you're talking about is 
We solve problems by adding more. We rarely solve problems by removing. And so if you're talking about that sloth diagram, something might have to leave or change in order for you to reduce, to allow that movement to flow back in. So don't only think about adding, also think about subtracting, not doing the one more thing, not going to other place so that you can just go take a walk or so that you can enjoy pulling your own weeds at your house or like whatever it is. I wanted people to have a place to start approaching moving more through a self-care for yourself lens. Even in the end, if your goals are this broader taxing systems that you don't really need to let other people that do really need them use them, if you could take up some of that work in a small stepwise way that felt good to you and made your life better as you had this goal of, you know, helping other people too, how would you do that? That's where we think your position came in. It's like a, you know, you just open it up to the section of body parts um, where you're like, okay, it's my knees. Like I know that I would walk to work if I could just make my knees feel better. So what are some things that I can do? Not just exercises, but lifestyle shifts, ways to think about using less. Like I'm a big fan. I'm a minimalist. I mean, I don't know how that works. Is there a minimalist economics? Heck yeah. We just interviewed Christine Platt, the Afro minimalist on our podcast, and she talks a lot about economics. Yeah. I've really stripped down a lot of the things that I have and the space that I take up physically. But I would say it's a different way. That approach to minimalism is for me about maximalism of those materials that are within myself, right? So it's another kind of wealth. Like I, I just think of it as of a wealth that I'm creating within myself that has equal, if not more value than money, because there are a lot of things that money can't fix. There's a lot of things that people have tried to solve physically that money can't fix. And so I'm, an, I'm again, I'm not an economics person at all, but I would say that that's a version of wealth that we could say is quite valuable. To me, it's quite valuable. I want to challenge you to start calling yourself an economist because the root of the word economy is home care. Ecos, nomio. Ecos meaning home, nomio meaning management or care. And from what I read, you do a lot of caring for our home, including our physical cells, our bodies. Well, our physical, right. So what's a home? Like you are your first home and then the place that you are sort of depending on extracting everything from. That's your second home with your house being the third home. So I definitely try to keep that in mind where, you know, I write myself in this, in that order, you know, order align with the self, align with the land and all other things that need it. And then thirdly, with sort of those material pieces that make my life easier. I mean, simply easier and longer. I would love to hear if you have a little bit more time to share with our listeners about this incredible book that is was just before Rethink Your Position, Grow Wild. And you have anything you want to share around that book. And particularly, you have these amazing other people that you feature in that book. You've got Deona Reese Williams, who does this nature school, Dr. Tia Ukpi Wallace, and her kind of physical therapy around women and baby carrying. You've got some beautiful stories around work on food sovereignty and movement. So I would love to hear just anything that's alive in you to share about that book and any stories you'd like to share with our listeners. Well, books are like children. You can't really have a favorite, but you're talking about Grow Wild. And I mean, it's sort of my favorite right now. And I think it's because it's the least nuts and bolts within a person and the most about if you thought about every person and community as being a nut and bolt in a larger body of just not just the collection of humans, but the humans being a part of all the other living things that are here trying to make it, that are here trying to make it in relationship with everything else. That book is looking at cultures as containers, is broken down into containers where culture is one and all these different, kind of like I gave sloth as a container for our time. When you're inside that time, there are these sub containers. So you're always within your culture, but sometimes, and you're always in your clothing. Like even your clothing is something that's 
I mean, you will imagine anyone listening knows there's major economics behind clothing because it is something that we all have agreed upon <laughs> that needs to be, we need to be adorned with, you know, all of the time. And we make choices that don't always facilitate movement, not only movement of just our joints, but like movement of other people outside of factories, right? Or making our own clothes. So like, this is the book where I'm getting into all of those layers, although you might not recognize it at first without this primer of this podcast. But I was looking at people who were using movement in different ways. So a big part of, I think, our culture or our economics right now is the way we relate, or I should say don't relate to the natural world. We don't really see ourselves as part of nature. Even the language is a bit problematic around there, but we really have a hard time not highlighting culture as the main sphere we're operating in, politics as the main sphere we're operating in, without sort of equal knowledge to the weight that really the primal relationship here is between the earth, the planet, and like us sitting on top of it. So just trying to keep that relationship there. So when we're talking about why we are all so sedentary and then simultaneously why we have this sort of production consumerism problem is because we don't really know how stuff is made. Like I think that there's like an education gap and I think it's worse in this generation than it was before. Like we just keep becoming less and less aware of what we are consuming, how it is made, where it is coming from. We use language like the cloud to make it seem like it's just ether and nebulous and not actually nuts and bolts on the ground plugged into something that's humming and taking things like data so, banks. And yeah. Yeah. It's all sort of just invisible. It's all just over there where you can't see it. And that's, I think whether it's on purpose or really just the only way we can deal with the, the cognitive dissonance of it all, it's a reality. So with Diona, I was talking about nature schools for me, for my kids, you know, and I'm thinking about like, okay, we're trying to create new systems. New systems are going to be generational, right? So how do I need to be thinking about the things I imagine you're talking about? How do I put that into my parenting? How do I put labor into my parenting? Not just teaching kids that exercise is good for them, but really this is what it takes to get food. So we're going to have to go to the community garden. Or you imagine if you used a car to drive everywhere for even these little walks right here when we're physically able to do them. That's just been part of my parenting. And nature school access is easier in some places, like in a way that there are food deserts for people. There are also nature deserts for people. And so I picked a nature school that was in a literal desert, not a nature desert, but a literal desert where people would be like, how could you possibly do a nature school for children in Arizona? You know, and so we featured some of how that was done, but just in a way that allows other people to see like, oh, right, this is what it takes to get my kids outside more and to create a fundamental relationship, maybe the most important relationship outside of the relationship with yourself. Like I think of, again, that's your main home, but then you need to be able to have a dialogue of sorts with the landscape that you are depending upon for your survival. Like how do you come to see it as a thing that has a balance of its own and a set of needs of its own? So like I'm a big fan of nature school. So that's why she's She's in there and she's got a podcast that you can listen to as well if anyone's interested in following that. And then Tia, right, she's a physical therapist, but she's not just a physical therapist only to work on your parts. She's trying to – she specifically is – this will be my assessment of it – is helping create – instead of just you and your physical body, she's trying to deepen that relationship between you and yourself, but specifically around the pelvis and pelvic areas. If you were going to know all the areas of yourself, that's one of the, you probably know the backs of your hands more than you know what's going on in your own pelvis. Like, cause you see your hands more. You've never been guided to understand that particular area. So she's helping people connect their physical experiences that oftentimes are manifesting that come out of not only, I would say, experiences in the pelvis whether you are going down the path of having children or not, like we all have this pelvis that we're dealing with and it's just such a complex secret piece. And so she's really helping flush out that relationship that 
interestingly enough, in the same way that nature is a source, the pelvis is a source for all of us. And it's also like nature. We're just not really looking at it. So there's there's something about not wanting to take deeper looks that might be part of how the whole machine is running forward. So slowing down and taking out some of those looks. So her work is rich in restoring some of that relationship with self. And then Philip Brass, I wanted to include, Philip Brass is in a section, I I said that the book was organized in containers and food is one of those containers in our life that we spend a lot of time in. We, if you're just ordering food out and it's just something that you just do for nutrients and that's your total relationship is just like, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. That is a very new relationship with food. Really, the relationship between humans and food is what connected them all the way down to the earth, right? The land. So as we've stepped away from a really connected food system where we were participating physically, looking at the moon, looking at the seasons, looking at the soil, looking at what else was starving and coming in and eating from what we had cultivated, seeing what other people needed or wanted or wanted to take. You know, like we're so removed from those realities. Many of us, a lot of people are not. I wanted to include an indigenous perspective because what I was saying in the book, many indigenous people have been saying for a very long time. And so I wanted to allow Philip to say it in the way that he wanted to say it. And also just to show people that I do think Even in activist spaces or progressive social movement spaces, movement can be always still thought of as exercise and sort of diminished. And I wanted to show the physical movements that we're talking about are part of these other complex things. Like they're not separate. And we're like trying to solve these complex problems without looking at the elephant in the room, which is nobody wants to move for them. And so to restore that physical relationship within yourself and then use it as a tool to get other things in whatever way that looks for you, I think is holistic, as you were saying. So that's what that book goes into. And I wanted a lot of different voices in that book. I mean, it's mostly my voice, so it's not like an anthology of a bunch of other people talking. But I wanted to pepper it with other people who are like, these people are also doing this sort of work because it's important to their community. For me, of course, it's important to me on the personal level. It's also important to me on the scientific level. But many people's like lives and cultures depend on some of the things that I was talking about. So I just wanted to paint a very broad perspective. And that's just, you know, all I can say about my favorite child. (laughs) Well, well done. It's a beautiful book and very thought-provoking. As we wind down our conversation, I hope that so many of our listeners were out moving while they were listening to this on a walk, moving their bodies, taking breaths. We do dance breaks in our MBA program so that folks really continue to stretch themselves outside of the sedentary lifestyle. And I hope they'll go for a walk to their library or to the local bookstore and pick up a copy of your book. Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners? maybe how folks that are listening can support this. And I'll use the movement as a little bit differently now, like the movement of people that you have mobilized to think differently, to do this lifestyle redesign, maybe how listeners can support that or things that you'd like to leave our listeners with. If you're talking about supporting, you know, the movement movement, right. Which is the not necessarily, and I'm not an anti exercise person. It's just that it's such a limited way of thinking about it is just to figure out where you yourself could move just a little bit more and then share that. Another big part of Grow Wild is about community. You know, another piece that's missing from our culture slash economics is in that traditional economy, you know, where everything is so much more local and shared amongst a group of people versus like looking at that material prosperity or wealth was shared by a collection, not really by a single. So just to always be thinking of spreading your movement wealth with other people, inviting other people, figuring out ways that not only like liberate your sedentarism, but others in a group. And that will end serve you more as well, because it means that you're more likely to 
stick with it and change the local systems that you're participating in is the best way I think that you can support or start to change the paradigm. You know, paradigms change very slowly because the collective is moving in one direction, but you are part of the collective. So if you move in a slightly different direction, you effectively, I always think of paradigms as big, heavy ships coming into port where they have to turn their brakes off, you know, 25 miles away because there's so much momentum that paradigms have. And so one way to put on the brakes is if more people start going in any other direction. It's like a current. So if we can move, you know, the current a little bit more, then eventually you change the paradigm. Well, Katie, thank you so much for this conversation and for all your work. And we will link to a number of resources in the show notes and stay connected and just appreciating you sharing just a little bit of a teaser of some of your thoughts today on the podcast. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. This is Katie Bowman, The Economist, signing off. (laughs) Amazing. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Before you go, we wanted to let you know that our spring cohort of the Next Economy MBA begins on March 26th. If you're an entrepreneur seeking to create a business that works for all life, a member of a team looking to transition your organization into one that is more regenerative and democratic, or someone who's considering a career or livelihood transition in embodiment with your values, we designed this course for you. Over this nine month learning journey, you'll have the chance to learn practical skills around business and life design based on our work with over 250 social enterprises. In addition to live sessions, you can deepen your experience and practice with special sessions, affinity groups, and connections with over 500 alumni who have participated in the course. Interested in learning more? Visit lifteconomy.com forward slash MBA to view our course curriculum and sign up for a free intro with one of our facilitators. If you're ready to sign up, you can use the code podcastmba to save 10% on tuition. We hope you'll join us.